yeah, the explosion came back. It had to. <laughs> and Thomas is excited. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy early Thanksgiving. Before we get started, I got a couple of things. Uh, I want to thank all the men of the church. Uh, y'all may have noticed when, when you came in, the, the, the hump in the floor is much less humpy. <laughs> uh, the other night, we had a few of us here crawling under, under this, this old church until like 9 o'clock the, in, in the evening. And it was dark and moist and gross and but our floor is, is a lot more solid than it used to be. I still wouldn't recommend dancing. But I, I want to publicly thank all the men that, that came and have had a contributing factor into, into fixing our home. So thank you guys. No, no, we will not let you earthquake check this, no. Um, also, last night... Uh, we were notified that some former members of our church were going through a pretty, pretty horrible family hell. Uh, the, the Ashford family was, uh, Tommy had been missing since Thursday. Um, and I, I'm, we, we prayed, and I don't know, if, I, I believe in the power of prayer, but that went out everywhere. And the power of prayer works. Uh, as of 8.53 last night, Tommy was safe and sound. Uh, I'm not sure any of the, the details, but praise God, Tommy is safe. So, so thank everybody for praying for, for that young man. He, he desperately needed it. A um, couple of other announcements for you guys before we, uh, before we dive into worship today. We've got our Cross and Crowns Friendsgiving, December 1st, right after service. It's next Sunday. If you haven't signed up to bring something, see Amanda. She will put you on the list of, and tell you what other tasty goodies we still need to have. Uh, but that's going to be a fun time. This is a great time to get together and, and just kind of hang out as a family. Yes, Henry? Um, we have plates. <laughs> bring some. Yes. So, if, you need, if you're not on the list yet, see Amanda after church, and, and she'll get you hooked up on the list. Age appropriate, yes. Church appropriate, Henry. No f- adult beverages. Anyways, <laughs> December 3rd, we have, right after Bible study, we're going to have a very short members meeting for Cross and Crown Motorcycle Ministry. Uh, if you can't be there, uh, not, not everybody is going to be able to be there, and we understand that. Uh, but we're going to, basically all we're doing is we're voting on the changes on the bylaws that we'd made uh, in the months meeting previously. Uh, so we will make sure that we have everybody's vote ahead of time that isn't going to be able to be there. Uh, so that's December 3rd, roughly 7-ish, depending on how long Bible study takes. Uh, if you can't be there, talk to Ryan. He'll, we'll get you hooked up with either a Skype link or we'll get your vote. December 7th, here at 5 o'clock, the first Christmas is happening. Come celebrate the first Christmas with the Cross and Crown kids and some various other adult children that are going to be in the play too. Uh, this, is, this is going to be an amazing event. Uh, they, we, we did a play last year and it was fantastic. My wife was a wonderful shining star. I was a beautiful tree. Uh, that's about what I'm good for, is a tree. <laughs> but December 7th, 5 o'clock, come celebrate with us. These kids have worked really hard on this. Uh, and so have the adult kids. But these kids have worked really hard. Uh, we're, I want to start pushing this out to the community. So everybody that's online that watches us, please come. Let's support the kids. It's going to be a great time. We'll have some flyers and stuff that we can hang out and hand out and pass out. Uh, there is a Facebook event for this, absolutely. We'll get it made sure to everybody can share it and send it out to everybody. Uh, but let, let, let's make a special night for these kids because they've worked so hard. Uh, December 15th, the great t-shirt swap Aram is going down. If you haven't given your size and your name to Amanda yet and you want to participate, please do so by the end of service today. Uh, but th- this is a great time. Ma- again, let's make sure that we're, 
we're church appropriate. That doesn't mean you're not allowed to be funny. That means you can be church funny. But let's make sure that we're being appropriate. But this is a riot. We did this last year, and we had so much fun doing this. Uh, basically, you know, you pick a name out of a hat, and you get to go buy a funny t-shirt for this person. It was a good time. I still wear mine, John. <laughs> you got me a tank top. But the sleeves falling off. It was great. No, that was oh, that was Ian. I'm sorry. I had an answer. That's right. I'm like, I didn't know you so December 5th, that's December 15th. And we're going to do that right after church. December 22nd, we have this. Nobody knows this yet. December 22nd, this guy's coming back. Ice is coming back to preach. Uh, I'll tell you, it was awesome. I was sitting at home and I get a message from him. And he says, hey, do you guys do a, a Christmas Eve service? And I said, yeah. And he goes, how would you like me to come and preach on the 22nd so you can focus on writing something for Christmas Eve? And I'm like, that would be wonderful. And the people of the church would love to have you back. So I'm excited to announce that he's going to be back on, on that Sunday. Uh, we're we're going to get together with him and I'm, I'm assuming with a bunch of the guys from Higher Calling uh, and we're going to worship and hear some really good, uh, really good preach. I love listening to nice preach, so it's going to be awesome. Uh, lastly, we also have... Christ, uh, we are doing a Christmas Eve service. That's December 24th at 6.30 right here. Uh, I promise I will not be long-winded for this one uh, because it is Christmas Eve. Uh, but we have traditionally done a candlelight service, and I think we should continue to do that. Um, this is open to everyone in the community. This is open to... Fr- uh, we don't care if you, if you are one of the Christmas and Easter church people. We want you to come. <laughs> this is, it, it's a great time. It's, one, it's beautiful with all the candles. Uh, so invite everybody, uh, and we will be doing that right here, 6.30, December 24th. Please don't forget to drop your tithes and your offerings in the boxes in the back if you're not currently giving online. For all of our people that watch us online, we love you. We love that you tune in throughout the week. Uh, if you are not contributing uh, if you're not supporting this ministry financially, I'm going to ask if you would prayerfully consider doing so. Uh, God has called our church to do some pretty ambitious things. And I love the fact that people, we, we have roughly three or 400 people a week support this church by watching our sermons every week online. Uh, and I'm straight up asking you guys if you'd be willing to participate uh, and willing to contribute to the mission and the ministry of this church. Uh, if you are willing to do that, you can visit our website, which is crossandcrownchurch.me, and you can give right on there. With that being said, let's stand and worship God. All right, have a seat, everybody. So we don't have any kids to release already, so we'll skip that one. Hi, Ryan and Stacy watching from Rhode Island, by the way. We miss you guys. So today I thought would be something, I mean, we, we got Thanksgiving right around the corner. And I, th- I thought it would be fitting to talk a little bit about Thanksgiving. I need to ask y'all a question. Anybody else look forward to leftovers <laughs> compared, compared to the regular? I'm sorry, the second round through hits different, doesn't it? <laughs> Those turkey sandwiches are just, they taste better. Speaking of the holidays, I feel like this has been more of a debate this year than it is in any other year than I've, I can remember. It's the debate over when the Christmas season should start. This is a, this is a debate in our house. Because in July, my Christmas tree would be up if it was up to Amanda. Uh, I am a firm believer that you wait until after Thanksgiving. I heard it recently that Thanksgiving was called the John the Baptist of holidays just because it's the predecessor to the greater holiday that was coming. And I thought that was really fitting because it really is kind of that way. And let's let's just kind of go ahead and separate the sheep from the wolves this morning. Who here believes that that Thanksgiving, we we should wait until after Thanksgiving to celebrate Christmas? Everybody, Everybody... all right, good. How about the, now, let's, let's talk, on the other side, who believes that right after Halloween, the tree goes up and Steve's out back doing jumping jacks. I see that. <laughs> hey, why wait till Christmas is a season, Thanksgiving is a holiday. No, 
The correct answer, by the way, is A, for all of you that might want to notice. Y'all, y'all, that I feel bad for Thanksgiving. You slapping Thanksgiving in the face like it's a second-rate holiday. Like it's an afterthought jammed in the middle of two other holidays. Shame on you people. Anyways, but seriously, I just kind of wanted to see where everybody was at on that this morning. I was th- I've been thinking a lot about Thanksgiving recently. Not just because we've got this holiday coming up, but the true idea of Thanksgiving. To give thanks, um, to live a grateful life. And I've been thinking about this because as we've talked about in recent weeks, we live in this, this culture that's constantly inundated with outrage. Anger and frustration and irritation are at the forefront of the majority of our daily communication now. On any, on any given day, you open up the news and it's headlines like, fear this. And you should be upset about this. And why aren't you outraged enough over this? And now there are times that, that we should be upset and we should be outraged over injustices in our world. I'm not talking about those things this morning. I am talking about the propensity to wake up on any given Tuesday morning and already be bombarded by, with this fear-based media marketing that desires to make us feel ungrateful unless we own certain things and our, our hearts bend towards this, this constant irritation with everyone and everything that doesn't live, think, drive exactly how we do. If ever there was a place that shouldn't be the case, if ever there was a place that, that should be filled with thankfulness and joy and gratitude and grace and mercy and patience and love, it should be the church of Jesus Christ, right? Right? Should be is the optimum word. One of the saddest parts of the church today, in my opinion, is that we're known far more for what we're against than what we're for. Instead of being people of, of perpetual gratitude, we fall prey to grumbling just as quickly as the next guy. You know, instead of never ending thanks, we're prone to constantly complaining, we're prone to negative. You know, negative thoughts were prone to griping just like the rest of the world. To be clear, I'm not up on a pedestal up here. Uh, don't put me up there. If you see me up there, knock me down. Uh, I'm not up here in an ivory tower throwing stones at anybody because I'm, if not as guilty, more guilty than anybody else in this. Because let's be honest, I mean, I can be a professional grumbler. I'm not going to lie. Just all he is. Charles Spurgeon once said, I don't think the church rejoices enough. We all grumble enough and groan enough, but very few of us rejoice enough. When I think about the people I love being around the most, that's all of you guys, by the way. Yeah, you made the list, Henry. <laughs> Almost everyone has one character trait in common. You guys are people of gratitude. People of joy, for the most part. Our attitudes, our actions, and our words seem to give thanks in what we do. And I appreciate that. You guys are all people who have tapped into the secret of 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18. Whether you know it or not, most of you, I bet you if I asked any single one of you what that scripture was without looking it up, you couldn't tell me. I couldn't, I couldn't either. But you guys have all tapped into this secret. And that's where we're going to be today. So grab your Bibles or something with your Bible on it. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 today. And we're going to basically stay just in verse 18. So 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. There's a lot there. I hear a lot. People ask me all the time, well, what's, what's God's will in my life? Pay attention today. This, we're going to go over that. I think it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to repent of our lack of rejoicing. 
The church itself is unhappy, and I don't understand why. Uh, it's a time that we need to regain the lost value of thankfulness. And that thankfulness is something that should be a distinguishing mark of a Christian. So here's the main idea that I want you guys to take away today. Here's your aha moment. Y'all remember those? Nobody's doing the aha sheets anymore, but that's all right. But here's your aha moment today. Thanksgiving is a command for all people at all places, during all things. That is part of our calling. So we have a command, we have context, and we have a calling. So I want to take a look at these three things today because it's all in this one scripture that we're talking about. First off, let's look, at a, let's look at the command. The command is to give thanks, right? It says, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We're commanded to give thanks. Y'all understand that, church? That is not a suggestion it's not a, if you feel like it. We are commanded to give thanks in all things. And in this increasingly secular age, thanksgiving is an oddity. We're not allowed to be thankful for stuff. We're supposed to expect things, right? It's one of the few traditional holidays that hasn't been corrupted or renamed yet. We have winter break. Happy holidays. Ah. There's no offensive Starbucks cup that goes with it or anything. Most companies and most organizations take a break for a day with the purpose of giving thanks, at least theoretically, until midnight when people go insane over Black Friday shopping. Remember when you used to have to camp out for Black Friday shopping? Now you go online. Thanksgiving is a kind of universally recognized day set aside to give thanks that, and it hasn't been co-opted by any political agenda yet. That's why Thanksgiving is one of my favorite holidays. However, this puzzle, the puzzling question in our expanding atheistic culture is who are people expressing thanks to? Who are they saying I'm thankful for fill in the blank. Who are they expressing their thanks to? It's easy to sit here and pick on atheists for their, their inconsistencies in gratitude, though. But I can't help but wonder if, if we, too, have missed the Bible's teaching on Thanksgiving. Because we, as believers, knowing what Jesus has done for us, many times we live thankless lives in inconsistency and we live that way more than an atheist who refuses to give thanks because you know you know and I know who we're supposed to be thankful for right we know who we're supposed to be thankful to so not giving thanks makes it so much worse Clearly, God knows something about our propensity for ingratitude. I mean, he has to remind us a lot throughout His Word. <laughs> he does. He reminds us a lot. And He even gives us a command for it here in 1 Thessalonians 5 to give thanks. And you know, one of the things I love about God is He's not subtle. God is not subtle. Variations of the word thank are used almost 150 times throughout the Bible. 38 of those times we're specifically told to give thanks. The Greek word for thanks is Eucharisto. That might sound familiar to some of y'all that grew up in church. Communion, which we're going to celebrate later today. At the end of service, we're going to have communion. But it's a word that Jesus used when he was having the Last Supper with the disciples, when, when he broke bread and he gave thanks. That's the word that he used. When, when we have communion, we're literally giving thanks in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. In Hebrew, there were seven words of praise and thanks. 
And I thought this was kind of cool. I heard a teaching once on this at uh, Kingdom Life Church up in Oakland, and I thought this was very, it fit very much into our service today, so I borrowed some of it. Check this out. First word is toda, which means a thankful choir. Barak, which means to kneel in thanks. Tehillah, not tequila. To sing a song of thanksgiving. Halal, which is where we get our word hallelujah from, is to give thanks by boasting and praising God. Yada, which gives thanks with an expressive gratitude, which, which, which is where our worship comes from. Zamar, which is to give thanks with a musical instrument. And Shabbat, which is to give thanks in a loud tone, shout to the Lord. Four out of seven times, that, those words are actually found in a single psalm. If we look at Psalm 100, verse 4, it says, Enter into his gates with todah, thanksgiving, choir. And into his courts with talah, singing his praises. Yada, enter, extend your hands to him, Barak, kneel in thanksgiving before his name. That's the original translation, guys. It talks so much about being thankful and worshiping. And it's something that we forget. Thanksgiving is supposed to be so central in who we are as followers of Jesus Christ that it causes us to sing His praises, shout His praise, lift our hands in praise, kneel in praise and worship. Some wonder why people put their hands up in the air and they sing at the top of their lungs during worship. By the way, can I just tell you how nice it is to be able to do that and not bounce on the floor? (laughs) That was such a different experience for me today. Why do people openly pray and weep in church? And it might look weird to some people. But they do that because they understand who it is that they're giving thanks to. Gratitude is what causes us to worship and it causes worship to come out of us. And you'll never be a worshiper if you're not grateful. Now I know what you're saying. I don't worship like that, Pastor Chris. I don't do that. Well, just because you don't do that doesn't mean you don't love God. I'm not saying that at all. I don't want you guys to hear that because I'm not condemning anybody for the way that you worship. The point I'm trying to make is that, that our thanksgiving at some point is going to flow from inside of our hearts and begin to affect our actions and that's going to look different for everybody. But it will happen. This type of thanksgiving is repeated and expected and commanded over and over and over and over again in God's Word. If you look at Psalm 92, it says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. And when we talk about this idea of of giving thanks, it's linked to who God is. We give thanks to the Lord. We sing praises to His name. And the more we learn about God, the more we lean into God, the more we should be praising and we should be glorifying Him. And that's where the Christian's thanksgiving diverges from the world's thanksgiving because this is not the way that the thanksgiving holiday is set up in our culture. The way, of, the way that we practice thanksgiving in our culture is it's generally this kind of glass half full thanksgiving idea. We focus on positive things and, and, and we look for the silver linings in things. But what prompts, us, what prompts us as believers to, be, to thanksgiving isn't looking for positive situations. It's knowing who walks with us through all situations. You know, one, one, of my, my, one of my favorite things is I remember the Apostle Paul said in, he finds joy in all things. When, when, when he's got everything, he's happy. When he has nothing, he's happy. Why? Because Jesus is in everything. There's a message in that. C.S. Lewis talked about how being thankful is woven into a life of worshiping God. He notes 
that our tendency is to give God thanks for what He's done for us. The blessings that He's bestowed upon us, namely that gift of salvation, amongst other things. Those, that, that's awesome, by the way. I'm not saying that it's not. And we should definitely do that. Count those blessings, church. But when, when we really get down to the root of what we are thankful for, that should spring from, for us, the believer, that should spring not just from what God has given us, but we should be thankful simply for who God is. Be thankful. Being thankful is one thing. But knowing who we're thankful to leads us to a life that is saturated with both thanksgiving and, I need you guys to hear this, thanks living. I think we should change the holiday to thanks living. Living a life of worship and gratitude and thanks and fellowship with the one true God should be our focus. I talk a lot about having an attitude of gratitude. Over the last four years, we've talked about that statement a lot. But I think Thanksgiving is far less about an attitude and far more about an action. Thanksgiving is one thing. Thanks living is a whole different, another thing. Having an attitude of gratitude is great. But it's only great as long as you follow up with the habits of gratitude. I'm going to give you guys an example. I'm going to say it like this. We, a lot of us watched boxing this past week. Okay? I want you guys to imagine you have a boxer's attitude. You own the trunks. You own the gloves. You even put them on and lace them up from time to time. You've got that little water bottle that they have and even the bucket that they spit into. <laughs> spit bucket. We can ask you to get in the ring and throw some punches, right? But with all of these boxing things, you've never actually boxed. Not once. You haven't put your boxing attitude into action. So, could we say you're a boxer? No. No, we can't. See, gratitude without practice makes it a little... makes. Maybe a little bit like faith without works. It's not alive. If someone claims to be thankful for Jesus in their lives but constantly complains, is irritated, and seems ungrateful for everything and everyone, what's going to be our conclusion about that person worse yet? What is the conclusion of the God that they claim to worship? So do you have a grateful heart? And that's a great question. That's a question that we should all be assessing in our lives each and every day. Do I have a grateful heart, Lord? But also, is your heart matched with your habits? It's one thing to be grateful. It's another thing to give thanks. Gratitude is what we feel. Thanksgiving is what we do. So practically, what does that look like? Well, I'll give you an example. Let's say you feel emotionally distant from your spouse. Start doing some of the things that you did in the beginning when you, when you started dating. Express gratitude. Write them little notes. Write the love notes. Put them in the lunchbox. Buy some flowers. Send little texts throughout the day. Not the texts that say, hey, don't forget to pick up dinner or don't get the, you know, make sure you get the dry cleaning. I'm not talking to those texts. <laughs> those little meaningful texts that make you go, aw, what they thinking of me? Here's a good one. Take a shower, get out your sweatpants and go on a date. I got one for you. How about send a note to your pastor thanking them for the way that they serve the church? I'm not soliciting notes. I'm just saying. I bet he wouldn't even be mad if there was a Dunkin' card attached to it. Thank you, Jesus. Your lips to God's ears. 
every night take five minutes and replay your day and ask yourself, where did God meet my needs today? Start, start asking people during small talk in your day, hey, what's made you grateful recently? Where have you seen God working in your life? Y'all, y'all, people ask me all the time, how do I start those questions? How do I start those conversations that, that steer people towards Christ, Pastor Chris? Here's a great idea. What are you grateful for recently? How have you seen God work it in your life? Practice gratitude. Practice having a thankful heart. Because see, church, we always have a reason to give thanks. Always. God has never stopped being good. Never, not once, ever. We've just stopped being grateful. God's never stopped being good, so, so we should never stop giving thanks. Even if the only thing in our lives that we have to be thankful for is God is good. We should always be thankful. You know, when I was researching out for this sermon, I came across an excerpt from a story. And it was this pastor that was begging his church, may we never be a people who come to church and sit on our hands indifferent to who God is. May we never come to church and look at the worship team and say, they better be glad that I showed up today. May we never come to church out of an obligation and think that we're worthy to be here in God's presence. May when our our feet cross the threshold of the sanctuary, may we feel the desire to worship long before the blessings have fallen into our lap. But maybe we worship God and give Him thanks simply and solely because of who He is. I love that. I'm claiming that for us too, guys. I love that. So we have a command. Give thanks. And there's context to that command. Y'all know I love context. There's context to that command. The context is give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Give thanks in all circumstances. Our command is to give thanks. Our context is to give thanks in everything. Notice how it doesn't say give, th- how it says give thanks in all circumstances, not for all circumstances. I need you guys to see that. We get that flip flop sometimes. We're not called to be thankful for every circumstance and situation that comes across our lives. This is one of the lessons that's best communicated by somebody that's been living for Jesus for a while. Because they've been around long enough to know that the Christian life is not one of permanent mountaintops. There are valleys in this walk with Jesus. Walk with God long enough and you're going to know and you're going to find out some things that you probably wish that you hadn't. Because let's face it, this is hard. But on the other hand, you're incredibly grateful for the things that God has shown you in those hard places because you get to know God on this deeper level because you become more reliant on Him. You get this deeper relationship, deeper than you've ever imagined, just like fasting. Henry and I had a great conversation about fasting this week and how when it gets hard, that's when you get deeper. That's when the relationship with God becomes so much closer because you're relying on Him to get you through your misery instead of a Big Mac. You get closer to God in those deeper places. And you learn to be thankful in your hard times even though you're not thankful for the hard times. Listen, God isn't commanding you to be thankful for the job that you just got laid off of. He's not commanding you to be thankful for the empty seat at your Thanksgiving table because someone has passed away. He's not telling you to be thankful for the betrayal that occurred in your life We shouldn't be thankful for seasonal affective disorder and the depression that it brings this time of the year. I'm not thankful for that. We're not not commanded to be thankful for all of our circumstances, but we're called to be thankful in all of our circumstances. In other words, we have to give thanks in the midst of everything. Not for everything, 
but in everything. I know what you're saying. I hear you, Pastor Chris. I hear you. You don't understand my situation. Do you know how many times I hear that? I understand. But you don't get what I'm going through. Like what you're going through is any different than somebody in Jesus' time. They all went through the same thing. No person in their right mind would ever give thanks if they were walking in my shoes. In this section. Yes, Jesus. <laughs> Man, if this is you, I need you to hear this, though. You're right. You're absolutely right. What, what I don't want to hear right now is somebody say, you know, if you just change your perspective, your praise is going to follow you know, there's a message there, but, and that is a, com a competent strategy. It's not a comforting one by any means. Whatever you're going through, I may not understand your specific pain. I may not. I may, I may know some of it. I may be able to relate to some of it. But I'm sure your brothers and sisters in Christ, somebody understands exactly what you've gone through. And I want to remind you that you're shoulder to shoulder with other, other believers who have walked through loss and financial hardship and hard times and depression. Y'all are sitting with people that have gone through all of this. But even more important and even more valuable than that, and I want you to know and if you hear nothing else today, hear this. Jesus himself knows what it's like to hurt. Forget that. Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to be misunderstood. He knew what it was like to be slandered and lied about and hunted down, broken, hungry, and abused. Jesus knows all of this. He knows what it's like to lose a loved one and weep. So when you say, nobody's going to understand what I'm going through, open your eyes and broaden your perspective. Jesus gets it if nobody else does. We do not serve a God who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, wounds, and weariness. He gets it. He gets all of it. And you know what? While we hope and we pray that He takes us out of our situation, what we can know for sure is that He walks side by side with you in your situation. That He sympathizes with you. That He never will leave you and He will never forsake you. And it's because of that knowledge that you can give thanks because His presence is with you, even in, in the presence of your enemies and in those circumstances, even when you don't realize He is there, He is there. Every time. All the time. You know, I came across this quote this week. What, uni what unites the high times and the hard times? What allows us to offer them both to God with sincere thank you? God's presence. I don't know what, what 2024 held for you. I don't know what 2025 is going to hold for us. But one thing I know is God was there. 2025, I know God is going to be there. He walks ahead of us and He invites us to follow Him in the pathway of peace. And the rougher the road the more He promises to hold our hand along the way. Don't forget that. You don't walk alone. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how dark it is, He is the light at the end of the tunnel. And whatever you find yourself in, you can still give thanks because the goodness of God is there. You know, I've got, some, I've got a friend that's going through some health issues out of state, and he said something so profound in the midst of all of it. He said, peace and joy are fruits of the Spirit, not fruits of my circumstances. I get chills just thinking about that, because I don't know about you guys, but there was like this purple cloud of smoke over my head when my mind blew up, because 
We always focus on, on the fruits of our circumstances, right? We forget that that fruit of the Spirit that's in us, that's where the joy and the peace come from. It doesn't come from what happens to us. And I pray that we realize that, that we can access that peace and that joy and that thankfulness and that gratitude even if our circumstances never change. Because we know who God is and we know who God always will be. And that's exactly what Paul meant in Philippians 4.13 when he said, I can do all things through Christ. This is a very recognized scripture right here. And this is something that we should all live by. I can do all things through Christ. You cannot do all things through yourself. <laughs> Preach it, brother. <laughs> I mean, we use that in sports, and we use it in tests, and we use it in job interviews, and I use it in my parenting sometimes. But don't forget the context of what Paul was talking about here. Paul is in prison, and he's writing about joy. He said, I know how to be on the mountaintop and I know how to be in the valley and I know how to have a lot and I know how to have nothing and I know what it's like for my belly to be full and I know what it's like to be hungry. I know how to be rich and I know how to be poor and I can do all things through Christ. We're commanded to give thanks in all, in all things. That's our context and that's because it's crucial to the calling that we have in our lives. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now we're getting to the good part, guys. Everybody wants again to know what's God's will in my life. Pay attention, here it comes. We all want to know what God's will is in our lives. So what does that mean? For this is the will of God in Christ, for Christ Jesus in you. What does that mean? It means that we rejoice always. We pray without ceasing. We give thanks in everything that we do, regardless, good, bad, or indifferent. We give thanks for it. And we give thanks in it. We need to realize that this applies to who? <laughs> this week I was doing a little homework with Georgia, okay? We, we, were doing, we were working on some language arts and we were working on modifiers in her, in her English class and I forgot what a modifier even was. <laughs> but anyways, we're talking about modifiers and this little phrase, in Christ Jesus, modifies what? It modifies for you. Meaning, for those of us who live in Jesus... For those of us who call ourselves Christians, for those of us that have gone deeper and call ourselves disciples of Christ, this is God's will for you. Being thankful always is not God's will for the world. Be nice if it was. Because the world can't be joyful and thankful always. Seems like nowadays they can't be joyful or thankful at all. They can't have gratitude. And why is that? It's because they don't know Jesus. They know about him, but they don't know him. They don't know about salvation. They don't know about that free gift that we get to have eternal life and live with him forever. They don't know this. And I know what you're saying, Pastor Chris. This isn't going to be easy for me. I'm not normally a happy-go-lucky person. I'm not the super positive person. I'm not even what you would call optimistic most of the time. I want to be thankful, but how am I supposed to do that? Well, the good news, the good news is, is it's not just God's will for you to will it. It, it's God's will for you to work on it. Philippians 2, 13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's not just wanting it, putting the work in. It's not just wanting it, it's putting the work in. 
when we accept Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit comes and dwells and lives inside of us, that, that's, that's what's going to characterize your life. It, it's, it's the gratitude that comes. And the thanksgiving that comes from that. Because it comes from the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. It's going to be as normal and as natural as breathing because you've got the Spirit of God willing to work inside you. And the result of that is thanksgiving. You guys know who Alistair Begg is? Alistair Begg. I love Alistair Begg's teachings. If you don't know who he is, I highly recommend do a, do a quick Google search and listen to some of his stuff. His preaching is awesome. He's funny. He said the call of a Christian life is to become what you already are in Christ. Colossians 2 and 6 says, Therefore, as you receive Christ, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And we're not just talking about past tense here. This is past, present, future. Once we receive Christ, we walk in him. It is always, it is constant. We rejoice in him and we give thanks to him. But the Holy Spirit needs to be inside you. Because for any of that to happen, you've got to have the Holy Spirit living in you. Without the Holy Spirit, this sermon is going to sound like a religious burden and another call to something that you are not equipped to carry. And I don't want that to be. It'd be the, the epitome of seeing God as a rules-based entity instead of a relationship-based God. But I'm here to tell you guys today that God sent Jesus to will and to work in your life. If you repent of your sin, if you repent of ingratitude, if you acknowledge God for who He is, and more importantly, for what He has done for you because of who He is, it's going to help you walk in the calling of your life. Brad, can you do me a favor? Can you run next door and let them know we're going to do communion here in just a second? And I'd like to have everybody come over for that. I thought it would be fitting to end today's sermon on Thanksgiving by celebrating the Lord's Supper. Uh, Amanda, would you pass that out for me, please? Because we're thankful for the eternal gift that we have of Christ Jesus. We're, we're thankful and we're grateful for our salvation. We're thankful for the power of prayer and that, that when we serve a God that hears us, we're grateful for a God that never changes. Steve, how are you? Bear with us online, people. We're just passing out the communion. Waiting on our children's church to come on over. So do you guys have a different understanding of Thanksgiving today? Do, are, are you guys seeing it where it's more than just... It's more than just a second-rate holiday. It's more than just a a day to separate out and just say thank you. It's, it's, it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. Let me get this stuff out in here. All right. So I want to share with you guys some stuff here. If I can get this open. Oh my goodness. That's right. We talked about the word communion earlier. The word communion literally means to share something. It refers to sharing a meal or breaking bread together at a table. When, when Jesus offered up the Lord's Supper, it was in the upper room. It's a reference to a meal that Jesus shared with his disciples before his death. 
It took place in a home which, which traditionally was called an upper room because it was literally a room over somebody's house. It's where guests stayed. And they were celebrating this meal called Passover. The Passover meal was eaten as a symbol or a reminder of how the nation of Israel was once enslaved by Egypt. And God rescued them. And He did it by instructing them to put lamb's blood on the doorposts of their house. And when the angel of death came, he would see the blood and he would pass over those houses. And as a result, again, the, the death would pass over and spare them. And God delivered them from slavery and he delivered them from death. Are they coming? <laughs> I want to wait for them. But that night that, that Jesus was betrayed, that night that he was handed over, that night that he was essentially killed, Jesus and the disciples shared this Passover meal together. And he took bread with his disciples. We're going to wait. So we're gonna, oh, here they come. Good. Here they come. Well, there's one. There's two. There's three. All right. All right, so again, the, the, the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night that he was handed over, he shared one last meal with his disciples. And they, they took bread, and Jesus said, take this. This is my body, which has been broken for you. So I want you guys to take that. And in the same way, he took a cup of wine and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is 1 Corinthians 11. Drink this and do this in remembrance of me. So you should drink that. And you see, Jesus was, he was comparing himself to the Passover lamb. It was a symbol of what he was about to do on the cross for everyone. And it was, he was saying that he was going to die in our place. His body would be broken. And he was showing them that his blood was going to be shed as payment for their sins. And from now on, that, that a meal would symbolize all of this to them and to the rest of the world for the rest of time. And just in case the, di the disciples didn't get it, he made it very simple by summarizing with a single phrase in Luke 22 verse 19, it says, do this in remembrance of me. And today I want you guys to do that. I want you to remember Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. And I want you to reflect on the changes that that has caused in your life. Because I look around this room. I don't know a whole lot of you before Jesus, but I know you from the time that you've been part of this church and I look at the changes that that act on the cross has done in every single one of your lives. And when we talk about Thanksgiving, I can't be much more thankful for anything other than that. Because I, I look at how your relationship with Christ has grown. I look how your passion to follow Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior in your life has become so paramount and so central in your lives that as a pastor, that makes me, I, I couldn't be prouder of that. But as a fellow believer, man, I'm excited to be on this journey with you. But we need to remember where this comes from. We need to remember that Jesus was beaten and broken for us, 
that he died to pay the penalty that we couldn't pay, that our sin debt was never something that we were ever going to be able to pay, and that we, God gave us an out. He gave us a Savior that got us to a point that he sees us as sin, sinless again. And that is through his, the blood of his Son. So I want to take a few minutes and I want us to remember and reflect on that. I just want you to take a couple of minutes in silence and I want you guys to just remember where God, where you were and what God brought you out of and where he's bringing you to. Because if we don't remember that, we have nothing else to be thankful for. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for loving us so much that you would spare nothing, not even your son, to save us from our own sins. Help us always to remember. Help us to remember that, you, that, that love that reflects his sacrifice on our behalf. Give us the strength to live our lives by faith Help us to, to stand strong in faith in your Son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So church, I don't have a final song for you guys today. I can't top celebrating Jesus with the Lord's Supper with a song. So I just want to say that I love you. From the bottom of my heart, I love you. From my, fa from my family to yours, happy Thanksgiving. And I'm grateful for all of you and I want you guys to practice that gratefulness this week. And not just with your family, but with people that you know, that you work with, people that you might not know, the lady that's standing in front of you at the Hannaford. Be grateful. Be blessed. I love you guys.